electricity bills have been climbing across the US, but the AI boom is making it worse. A lot worse. New data centers are popping up everywhere to handle ChatGPT, Gemini, and countless other AI tools. And here's the kicker. You're helping to pay for them whether you use AI or not. In Columbus, Ohio, residential customers saw their bills jump by $27 a month this summer. Philadelphia went up $17. Washington, D.C. up $21. You may not be using more power, but utilities are building massive infrastructure for data centers and passing those costs onto you. So how much is this AI blitz really costing us? And what can we actually do about it? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. This video is brought to you by 8 to Sleep. Whether you're a fan of generative AI or not, its rapid growth has had a powerful effect on grid planning. And the way utilities plan the grid directly affects your electric bills. Here's the thing. Figuring out how much AI is really costing us is tough for two reasons. First, the math is complicated. We're not talking back of the napkin calculations here. And second, we're working with incomplete data. Big tech companies aren't exactly transparent about how much energy their AI models actually use. The lack of transparency on big tech's end means that for most generative AI models, Estimates of their resource usage simply aren't available. The best we can do is speculate, but the problem is, is that speculation is constantly changing as the technology does. In the meantime, many of us are left wondering why our bills are jumping up when our own energy use isn't. And that's not to say that we've got absolutely nothing. In August, Google released a technical report outlining the resource consumption of its Gemini model. Altogether, Google claims that the typical Gemini text prompt uses about 0.24 watt hours of energy or about nine seconds of TV time. However, in Google's own technical paper, the authors acknowledge that AI users are already racking up billions of prompts every day. Those prompts are weighing on our wallets, directly or not. It's also worth reading the fine print here. These numbers haven't been verified by a third party, and as stated in a press release footnote, these findings do not represent the specific environmental impact for all Gemini text generation prompts, nor are they indicative of future performance. That brings us right back to the first problem with determining the scope of AI's impacts it's complicated. For the starters, the amount of energy used for training a model is not the same amount of energy used for maintaining and providing AI-based services to customers. In this figure from a recent study by the U.S. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, you can see a huge difference in the approximate operational time between AI training and inferencing. Inferencing is basically the response that you get from an AI when you ask it a question. When it comes to inferencing, not all tasks are comparable. Different types of queries require different amounts of energy, and models can vary wildly. Machine learning company Hugging Face is attempting to standardize AI's energy use with its AI Energy Score leaderboard, which is separated into categories. It shows how tough it is to make a one-to-one -one comparison. Image classification is the orange to text generation's apple, and generative AI is one hefty fruit basket. The median energy used for inference is slanted by larger customers or heavy users, and the bell curve is pretty warped. And the bad news is, residential ratepayers are the most vulnerable to these extremes because of the way that utility regulation here in the U.S. works. Rising electric bills are the most obvious impact. There's a direct link between the surge in data centers and higher costs for residential customers. So why does it happen? Simple. Data centers get special treatment. Why do they get special treatment? <laughs> because it's profitable for utilities. When data centers started ramping up for the AI boom, utilities had to boost their capacity to handle the sudden demand for power. For most utilities, the preferred age-old strategy to boost capacity is to design the whole system for the highest peaks of power consumption. In other words, utilities plan for the worst day of the year when the grid is straining to meet demand, that one egg frying on the windshield summer afternoon when everyone's cranking up the AC. Now, the way utilities like to do this is by building more, more transmission, more power generation, and more infrastructure. So when utilities need to handle power-hungry data centers, they build more infrastructure, more transmission lines, more power plants, <laughs> more everything. But all that building costs money. And where does that money come from? <laughs> Us. Your electric bills pays for these projects. Now you might think that's fair. I mean, after all, everyone benefits from a bigger grid. If demand is going up, costs should go up too, right? It's not quite that simple, though. For starters, utilities aren't typical businesses. They're government-backed monopolies. And the way they calculate rates, it's complicated and not very transparent. Even utility regulators don't have access to all the information they need to figure out if a utility's proposed rates are actually fair. Because here's the thing. Utilities profit by spending. 
When these companies go on a shopping spree, they do so knowing that they can initially justify the splurge by having residential ratepayers pick up the tab. And they can externally justify an addition to that tab by claiming that spending is necessary to meet climbing demand. Speaking of energy demands, there's another kind of energy consumption that we should really talk about. That's yours. While utilities are optimizing their power output 24-7, most of us are not optimizing our most important recovery system, sleep. That's where today's sponsor, 8sleep, comes in. I've actually been using 8sleep for years now, all the way back to their very first crowdfunded version. Their newest generation is the Pod 5 Ultra. The Pod 5 is a high-tech cover that you can add to any existing bed, packed with sensors and temperature control elements powered by, <laughs> of all things, AI. The newest generation introduces a blanket for the first time that extends temperature regulation across your entire body, not just the mattress surface. With the cover that I have, it's tracking my sleep stages, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, and more, all without wearing any devices. The pod uses precision temperature control to regulate your sleep cycles, cooling down as low as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or warming up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, with each side of the bed controlled independently. My wife and I each have our own ideal settings. The new Autopilot Health Check gives deeper visibility into health trends like abnormal heartbeats and breathing patterns. This isn't just about comfort, it's clinically proven to give you up to one more hour of quality sleep each night. I've seen a massive improvement in how I sleep with the temperature regulation and really miss it when I'm traveling. Head over to 8sleep.com slash Matt Farrell and use the code Matt to get $700 off your Pod 5 Ultra through December 1st. You can get 30 days to try it at home, but trust me, your body will thank you for this investment in better sleep. Thanks to 8sleep and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now back to how utilities are using AI's unprecedented energy appetite to justify building more infrastructure. With that in mind, the incentive to prioritize data centers is clear. We already know that big tech's rush to spit out generative AI products is sucking up massive amounts of energy, unlike anything we've ever seen, especially because we can't physically see inside the black box. Everywhere that data centers are discussed, the same word comes up over and over again. Unprecedented. It's no surprise then that utilities are fighting for attention from the likes of Amazon, Google, Meta, and Microsoft. By snagging these elite clients with generous discounts, utilities meet the outsized needs of data centers with more and more infrastructure, which then passes some of that cost onto residential customers. But here's the thing, we're not even using most of the grid most of the time. Duke University researchers explained it this way. A system utilization rate below 100% is expected for most large-scale infrastructure designed to withstand occasional surges in demand. Nevertheless, when the gap between average demand and peak demand is consistently large, it implies that substantial portions of the electric power system, generation assets, transmission infrastructure, and distribution networks remain idle for much of the year. These assets are expensive to build and maintain, and ratepayers ultimately bear the cost. So are there other ways to meet demand? Absolutely, but those methods don't make money. Or do they? And here's the thing, the fact that we're only using a fraction of our grid capacity, that's actually good news. It means we have room to solve this without building everything from scratch. I'll show you how in a bit, and in the Patreon extended cut of this video, I'll dive into how grid users of all sizes can reduce their consumption and cash in on it too. What about improvements in efficiency as AI becomes more common? Well, I'm actually optimistic that the future of generative AI will be less energy intensive. There's already signs of that happening right now. At the same time, that might not fix the problem. I don't have to tell you how much consumer AI products are booming. There's probably evidence of that right below this video. Increasingly, efficient bots, agents, and customer service lines that put you right in the shoes of Richard Deckard could be really cool and convenient and not at all insanity inducing. But they could also drive up demand even further, minimizing or negating those efficiency gains. This idea of increasing efficiency inadvertently leading to increased consumption is what's known as Jevons' paradox, which has haunted us since the 19th century. English economist William Stanley Jevons first theorized it would happen with coal. Here's another thing that people get wrong about data centers. Yes, they're getting bigger and using more power. And yes, AI data centers use even more. But these buildings aren't running at full blast 24-7. AI chips have limits, just like any hardware. Tyler Norris, who led that Duke University study that I mentioned earlier, points out that even the most sophisticated data center operators can't predict exactly how much capacity they'll need as the market shifts. So when things are uncertain, companies play it safe. They build extra capacity to handle potential spikes or changes in demand. The problem, of course, is that this exact overbuilding is what raises prices. But before I show you what this is actually costing people, I want you to know that there are ways out of this. 
Some states and utilities are already fighting back, and some of the solutions are surprisingly simple. But more on that in a bit. So what does this actually cost people? You probably already see it in your own electric bill. But let's look at the bigger picture. A Deloitte report from June shows that eight of the nine largest data center markets saw prices jump over the national average between December 2023 and December of 2024. Now that graph might make it look like Ohio got off easy, but that's definitely not the case. Ohio is still one of the hardest hit states. This past summer, the generation service portion of monthly electric bills for Columbus residents rose by a whopping $27. According to Utility American Electric Power, or AEP Ohio, limited generation supply combined with increasing demand for electricity is driving bills up for customers. But it gets worse. Because the power grid operates regionally, this problem spreads beyond individual cities. The regional transmission organization called PJM oversees electricity for 13 states. So it's not just Columbus feeling the heat. This summer, residential customers in Trenton, New Jersey saw their bills jump by $26 a month, Philadelphia went up 17, and Pittsburgh by 10. And in Washington, D.C., Pepco customers are paying an average of $21 more per month. All these areas are part of PJM's grid. And according to PJM's independent market monitor, data centers are responsible for about 75% of these rate increases. And here's what they said in a June analysis. It is misleading to assert that the capacity market results are simply just a reflection of supply and demand. The current conditions and capacity market are almost entirely the result of large load additions from data centers, both actual historical and forecast. And there's another long-term problem. When utilities keep building new infrastructure instead of maintaining what we already have, the existing grid suffers. Old equipment, lack of upgrades, and above-ground power lines in rural areas create a perfect storm. We're seeing more frequent and more severe wildfires as a result. Now, it isn't all bad news. While the strain brought on by the AI boom might seem insurmountable, what we're lacking isn't solutions, but will. In fact, new data centers could potentially make things more affordable and efficient if, and that's a big, big if, they collaborate with regulators and utilities. And here's a few ways how they can do it. Some states are starting to fight back. In June, Oregon passed House Bill 3546. It creates a new class of large energy use facility specifically designed to prevent cost shifting. For Ohioans that suffered this summer, relief might be around the corner. In July, the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio voted to approve a settlement put forth by AEP Ohio that ensures that new data centers pay for at least 85% of the energy they project that they'll use each month, even if they end up using less than expected. As of October, AEP Ohio has claimed that this tariff, which effectively forces accuracy in estimating data centers' energy needs, allowed for its backed-up interconnection queue to drop from 30 gigawatts worth of demand to 13 gigawatts. And notably, the utility went on record to say that a lot of these projects might have been duplicative or speculative once the Ohio Manufacturers Association accused AEP Ohio of inflating the original numbers, but it's still food for thought. There's a better way to manage the grid, and it's called demand response. The basic idea, instead of building more infrastructure, you shift when people use energy. I touched on this earlier, and honestly, there are so many ways to do demand response that it could be its own video. But here's one interesting idea from that Duke study. They argue that the key isn't how much energy we need, it's when we need it. Scaling back usage for a few hours can have powerful results, and this has big implications for AI data centers. Take PGM as an example. According to Duke's research, PGM could add 13 gigawatts of new load without building any new infrastructure. The trick? It's curtailment. Now, this isn't about cutting off renewable energy when there's too much. This is about reducing power demand. Big customers could switch to backup generators or battery storage systems, basically shift when they use power. Duke's research found that curtailment would only be needed 0.25% of the time. Put another way, the entire U.S. grid could handle 100 gigawatts of new data center load by cutting back for just two hours on average. And that's just one demand response approach. So what are these data center companies actually doing about all this new energy demand? I recently talked to Microsoft about how they're handling it, and they used a term I hadn't heard before, additionality. The idea is pretty straightforward, but important. Whenever Microsoft adds a new data center and needs to pull more power from the grid, they also add an equal amount of new carbon-free generation to that same regional grid. 
For example, their new data center in Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin is matched with a 250 megawatt solar project in Portage County. That's not just about going green on paper. That additionality means adding new clean energy to the system so that the overall grid gets cleaner as they grow. They also work with utilities on battery storage and specialized rate structures to help keep the grid stable and avoid driving up costs for everybody else. In other words, they're trying to expand the grid capacity in step with their own energy demand and to also help grow the clean energy pie at the same time. Then there's the technological approach. In 2020, Google announced that it had begun using an algorithm to shuffle around its computing tasks to align with the times that renewable energy is abundant. In 2023, Google adapted this routine for demand response, allowing the company to limit or reassign less urgent requests when the grid is stressed. It's pretty clever. So here's what we've learned. We can't manage the grid the same way anymore. AI data centers are different from a typical industrial customer, and we need to treat them differently. The good news, we can upgrade the grid for everyone. The solutions exist. I couldn't cover all of them in one video, but they're out there. This isn't a one fix to solve everything problem. We need utilities, regulators, and data center companies themselves all working together to make this happen. But what do you think? What's the best path forward for this? Jump in the comments and let me know. You can also check out the extended cut of this video over on Patreon. And a big welcome to new Supporter Plus members, Barrett K1973 and Douglas M. Smith. If you'd like to join, the link's in the description. Be sure to listen to my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll keep this conversation going. Keep your mind open, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.